This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And now, let's begin today's discussion by talking about Hillary Clinton, who was just officially fined for the actions of her campaign back in the year 2016. Specifically, six full years after the race took place, well, the Federal Elections Commission has issued a fine against both Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign as well as against the DNC themselves for violating a federal law and not accurately describing the payments that they made to a law firm, which then funneled that money to a former British spy. Now, before we get into the details of the case itself, I just want to let you know, in case you're not aware, that federal campaign finance laws, they make it so that the money that a person spends on their campaign is heavily scrutinized. And so, if a political campaign gives more than $200 to anyone, well, they have to report that person's name and their address, as well as clearly define what the purpose of that payment was. Which is exactly what the Federal Elections Commission is claiming that Hillary Clinton's campaign failed to properly do. Specifically, according to documents which just became public yesterday, the Federal Elections Commission determined that there was probable cause to believe that both the Clinton campaign, as well as its treasurer, Ms. Elizabeth Jones, as well as the DNC and its treasurer, Ms. Virginia McGregor, misreported the purpose of certain campaign spending, and in so doing, they violated federal law. According to these documents, the spending in question concerns a $1 million payment that a law firm called Perkins Coie, which was representing both the Clinton campaign as well as the DNC, made to another company called Fusion GPS. Because you see, officially, the Clinton campaign paid $175,000 to Perkins Coie in mid-2016 for what they described in their disclosure statements as quote-unquote legal services. And then likewise, the DNC, they officially paid $849,000 to Perkins Coie at roughly the exact same time for what they described in their disclosure statements as quote-unquote legal and compliance consulting. However, all the way back in 2017, which was just a year after the election itself, the truth behind these payments started to come out, meaning that these payments were not just made for general legal services, but rather the money was used to hire operatives through Perkins Coie in order to shield their conduct from public scrutiny. Here is, for instance, how one of the complaints that was lodged with the Federal Elections Commission described it. And for your reference, this particular complaint came from the Coolidge Reagan Foundation. Quote, by intentionally obscuring their payments through Perkins Coie and failing to publicly disclose the true purpose of those payments, the Hillary Clinton campaign, as well as the DNC, were able to avoid publicly reporting on their statutorily required FEC disclosure forms the fact that they were paying Fusion GPS to perform opposition research on Trump with the intent of influencing the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. And indeed, the facts in this particular complaint, well, they have been public knowledge since the year 2017 when this letter right here was made public showing the law firm Perkins Coie acknowledging their arrangement with Fusion GPS to create a salacious opposition research document to frame Trump. Now, we here at the Epic Times, we did reach out to the Federal Elections Commission for comment regarding this development, and they got back to us, but frankly, they didn't really say much of substance. Regardless, though, here's what they wrote to us in an email. Quote, the FEC has up to 30 days following notification of the parties to an enforcement matter to prepare and place the relevant documents on the public record. Until then, we cannot provide comment or disclose any information. Now, very likely, the obvious next question that you're probably wondering about is how much is the fine that they have to pay? Because after six years of investigating, and especially with the ramifications of the whole Trump-Russia collusion narrative that the dossier wound up starting, well, you would imagine that the fines might be significant. Well, here's what the Clinton campaign and the DNC agreed to pay the Federal Elections Commission. $8,000 for the Clinton campaign and $105,000 for the DNC. And also, they promised to not violate those same laws again in the future. Now, even though the campaign and the DNC agreed to pay those fines, they did not admit to any wrongdoing, and neither of them responded to a request for comment from us here at the Epic Times. However, shortly after this decision was announced, well, President Trump released a statement saying this in part, quote, wow, just out that the 2016 Clinton campaign and the DNC paid the Federal Elections Commission today for violating the law by failing to disclose that their payments for quote-unquote legal advice and services to law firm Perkins Coie was, in fact, a guise to hire numerous companies, all of whom are now named defendants in my lawsuit, to try and take down and illegally destroy your favorite president, me. This was done to create, as I have stated many times, and is now confirmed, a hoax funded by the DNC and the Clinton campaign. This corruption is only beginning to be revealed, is un-American, and must never be allowed to happen again. And as President Trump mentioned in that statement, which is something that we also discussed in a previous episode, he has now filed a federal lawsuit against both Ms. Hillary Clinton, as well as the other people who were involved in the creation and dissemination of the Steele dossier. And so again, perhaps as the case works itself out in court, we will have more details come out regarding what really took place behind the scenes in the year 2016. However, 
Let's fast forward now just a little bit and discuss what happened in the 2020 election. Because, as you're likely aware, one of the most egregious forms of potential election interference came in the form of big tech and big media blocking the dissemination of the Hunter Biden laptop story. And if you remember, the two main reasons that were given, at least by the media, for why they were not covering that story was because, for one, they claimed that the laptop was unverifiable, which was not the case, but we'll get to that in a moment. And secondly, the reason that they gave had to do with a letter which was published by several dozen former U.S. intelligence officials. Now, in that letter, these officials had no real evidence to suggest that the emails were either falsified nor that Russia had anything to do with the laptop. But instead, they said in that letter that their intuition was giving them a suspicion based on their former experience that this has something to do with Russia. And so here is what those officials, those former intelligence officials, wrote in their letter back in the year 2020. Quote, We want to emphasize that we do not know if the emails provided to the New York Post by President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, are genuine or not, and that we do not have evidence of Russian involvement, just that our experience makes us deeply suspicious that the Russian government played a significant role in this case. But as you already know, the media just ran with it uncritically and used this letter to dismiss Hunter Biden's laptop as being Russian disinformation. However, the truth had to come out sometime. And that sometime was two days ago. That's because on Wednesday, one of the former CIA officers who actually signed that letter, claiming that the laptop was somehow a form of disinformation, well, he took to social media and he claimed that his actions in signing that letter helped to swing the 2020 election away from Donald Trump. Here's specifically what Mr. John Seifer, who has worked for decades as an operations officer at the CIA, here's what he wrote on Twitter. Quote, I take special pride in personally swinging the election away from Trump. I lost the election for Trump. Well, then I feel pretty good about my influence. That is pretty unambiguous. However, the dams have appeared to really broken. That's because besides the CIA officer statement that we just read a moment ago, well, more and more media are beginning to actually report on the story. Of course, we already mentioned how about a week ago, the New York Times finally admitted that the laptop was real. However, now the Washington Post just ran a story titled, quote, Inside Hunter Biden's Multi-Million Dollar Deals with a Chinese Energy Company. And those deals, by the way, they're the ones where Hunter Biden was holding 10% for the big guy. Then also you had CNN running a fairly blistering segment on how the federal investigation into Hunter Biden is, quote unquote, heating up. And then you had a Wall Street Journal article, just likewise about three days ago, publish a very critical story of how prosecutors are advancing their tax probe into Hunter Biden. And that particular story has to do with his dealings over in Ukraine as well as Kazakhstan. And so even though they are quite literally two years late, well, at the very least, the truth is beginning to come out into the mainstream press. If you'd like to read more about either the Hillary Clinton development or about the Hunter Biden story, including all the recent articles which have finally come out regarding his business dealings, I'll throw all those links into the description box below this video for you to check out. And all I ask in return is that you take a super quick moment to smash, smash, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about the future of America on the global stage. Mm. Wait. Hello? Hey Roman, it's me. Yeah, I wanted to let you know about the sponsor of today's episode, which is an awesome company called AMAC, which stands for the Association of Mature American Citizens. They are quite literally one of the fastest growing conservative organizations in America, especially for those who are over the age of 50. Although frankly, you can be any age to join AMAC. And their benef membership benefits include three different things. The first one is the money saving benefits because they give you a ton of discounts on things like restaurants, vitamins, uh, oil changes, all types of stuff. You can check out their website for the full list of benefits. It's pretty exhaustive. The second benefit is that they give you a subscription to their bi-monthly magazine. It's called the AMAC magazine and it's awesome. It has cutting edge news as well as really, really crisp analysis. And then the third benefit that a lot of members say is their favorite benefit is that AMAC fights for you, for your values on Capitol Hill. Because as they say, there is currently a socialist storm brewing in this country and AMAC is one of the largest organizations fighting back against it. And so if you care about the future of this country, consider joining the 2 million patriots who are already members of AMAC. Just head on over to amac.us forward slash facts matter. That's amac.us forward slash facts matter and join today. As they say, the memberships are great, but the cause is even greater. I'll also throw a link to AMAC down in the description box below. And now let's head on back to the studio. Now, while I was down in Florida about two weeks ago, I had the unique opportunity to sit down and speak with Mr. Jeffrey Lord, who is a former member of the Reagan administration, and we discussed the new changing global order and what America's place in it can look like. Take a listen. Let's uh, discuss what's happening right now in Ukraine. And let's begin the discussion maybe prior to the Russian invasion. So prior to when the troops hit the ground, what do you think some of the largest contributing factors that led up to the invasion? Was it the NATO expansion? Was it 
uh, so some of the weakness that was seen in Afghanistan. What's your opinion? First of all, and as a matter of fact, right before I came on, I saw that some group out there had unearthed a Biden, some Biden remarks when he was running for president that said if they didn't remove Trump, something would happen in Ukraine. <laughs> well, it turns out to be the reverse. And uh, I just think that, you know, President Reagan used to talk about peace through strength. And uh, within days of taking office in 1981, he was asked at a press conference uh, how to deal with the Soviet Union. And he shocked everybody by saying, when you're dealing with people who take it upon themselves to lie, to cheat, to steal, he says, you need to be very aware of the kind of people you are when you sit down with them. Uh, he went on to, I mean, there was an audible intake of breath. The White House press corps had never heard a president talk like that. And as he proved later on, you know, would call them the evil empire. He put Pershing missiles in Europe. In other words, that was peace through strength because Gorbachev didn't dare, uh, and it was before Gorbachev, actually, they didn't dare go down that road with Ronald Reagan. Uh, they didn't go down that road with Donald Trump either. But they're watching Joe Biden, who I think has his own particular circumstances uh, that are not good personally and being mentally, you know, on the ball. But they're watching the American border. They're watching the pullout from Afghanistan. And they draw the conclusion very quickly that he's weak. And thus, this is what happens. Uh, weakness invites aggression. And uh, this is, I, I can't tell you how dangerous this is. You know, Joe Biden is going to be president for at least three more years, two more years, whatever. Uh, there's a lot of room for bad things to happen, and they're happening. Vladimir Putin is, uh, you know, a former KGB agent. And I was reading something that he was assigned to East Germany in the days of the Cold War. And then, of course, East Germany, from his point of view, fell. And German reunification and the Cold War and uh, communists were driven out of East Germany. He doesn't want to see this happen again. And if anything, I think he wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union. So he is very tough, very skillful, and very determined. And that is a problem. So along that line, so a lot of what you discussed was sort of what led up to the invasion and what perhaps allowed it to happen, the circumstances right. allowing it to happen. What I found is that a lot of media are not covering why it is that Putin is making these decisions. Yeah. They're just, I mean, I was watching CNN last night for the first time in forever, and, <laughs> and they were, and they were you know, talking about Putin's mental state. Yeah. Who's he listening to, et cetera, et cetera. Never, and it, sort of treating him as a madman. But I believe that behind all seemingly rational actions is just a rationale that you might not understand. And so I, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Prior to the invasion, Putin gave a lengthy press conference where he kind of like, you know, rambled on for a bit. But the media focused on him saying that he wants to restore the Soviet empire. Right. However, in the original Russian, what he said was something more akin to restoring the Russian empire. He said that Lenin had made a mistake in signing the brent slavisk Pact with Germany ending Russia's involvement in World War I, but in that process, ceding Estonia, Lithuania, uh, uh, Latvia, Poland, as well as Ukraine, which eventually allowed them to become states right. that it later got incorporated into the Soviet Union, but as states, not as part of Russia. He said that that was a big mistake, and I, and I guess he wants to incorporate those back into the fold as, who knows, vassal states, as entities, who knows. Do you think that's that's what's driving him? Because that's what he said. Yes. Do you I, think that's what's driving him, or is it, or is, is it something else? What's your insight on that? No, I do think I do think that's what's driving him. I mean, to remember Russian history, Peter the Great, Lenin himself. I mean, the czars, uh, and then of course one can't forget Stalin. Uh, these were ruthless people, ruthless dictators, most of them, and. Uh, they wanted an iron-fisted control over Mother Russia. And I, I think that Vladimir Putin is very much in that mold. That's exactly who he sees himself as. As he's shown, he is not afraid to do something about it. And, you know, frankly, the Obama administration was asleep at the switch. He did this with Crimea. And what happened? Nothing. So what's the lesson that he takes from that? that he can do this and get away with it. And uh, I think he is determined to do it. I mean, that's who he is. That's his mentality. Moving forward now, what do you think the best course of action for the U.S. would be to deter Putin? I think 
you know, listening to Senator Josh Hawley yesterday here at CPAC, I think he's right on the money. Uh, deal with energy. I mean, this business of once again making the United States dependent on foreign energy sources, we should be the number one producer of energy in this world. There's no sense letting Vladimir Putin take that role because, you know, all of these uh, invasions and everything, among other things, they cost money. You got to pay for it. And he's able to pay for it at this point with, with his energy supplies. The whole deal with canceling pipelines in this country and canceling drilling on federal lands and then allow, giving a thumbs up to the Nord Stream pipeline. I mean, this is insanity. I, I know they've now reversed it, but I think energy is the way to do it. Grab him by the purse, and I think that will make it stop. And as a, as a matter of fact, that is what President Reagan did with the Cold War with Gorbachev. What he went about was uh, the strategic defense system, as it was called, which was satellite-based laser-type things that would take out an, an incoming nuclear attack. Well, the Russians couldn't afford to do this. And Reagan piled it on and did it. And in October of 1986, we were in the middle of the White House political office of sending him around America to campaign for candidates, and suddenly Gorbachev said he wanted a, a summit in Iceland. So Reagan goes, to our dismay, because we wanted him to out there and give giving candidate speeches. He goes, they're in this little schoolhouse, wooden schoolhouse, and they reach an range of agreements on uh, nuclear missiles and, and halting uh, nuclear proliferation. And then it, suddenly at the very end, Gorbachev says, but I can only do this if you cancel Star Wars, uh, as they were calling it, defense initiative. Well, Reagan said, I'm not going to do that, and Gorbachev pressed. And Reagan, I was told by some of the people who were there, slapped his hand on the table, looked at his secretary of state sitting next to him, and said, uh, George, we're leaving. And with that, got up from the table. They walked down the stairs. Gorbachev scampers to keep up with him, and Gorbachev says, I don't know what else I could have done. And Reagan says, you could have said yes. Gets in the car, flies home. A year later, there was Gorbachev in the East Room of the White House to sign a nuclear treaty, and there was no mention of SDI. They couldn't afford SDI, and they couldn't afford a lot of things they were doing. And Reagan understood that it was money that was driving some of this. So he put the squeeze on them, and it worked. Do you feel like there's any, any scenario where punitive actions towards Russia are, are done in a way that does not push them to be closer to, to China and the Chinese Communist Party. That's a that's very tricky, Roman. I mean, I, I think, you know, they're both dictators, right? And their view of the world is that the West is too dominant and they need to have some sort of uh, control over what's going on in the world. So, uh, not to be forgotten, they're each going to look after their own best interests. But I think it's very clear that they're working as much as they can, hand in glove with each other uh, to overtake the West, whether it's with the Pacific Fleet, you know, a Navy for the Chinese, or whether it's expanding like uh, in Ukraine, like Russia is doing. Uh, this is a real problem, and I frankly don't know what the solution to that is. Now, if you'd like to watch the uncensored cut of that interview, as well as a plethora of other phenomenal content, you can do so over on Epic TV, which is our awesome no censorship video platform. I'll throw a link to Epic TV. It'll be right there at the top of the description box. And also, if you use promo code ROMAN, you can get a 14-day free trial, so you can watch everything on there for 14 days without paying a penny. Again, the link will be right there at the top of the description box, and just use promo code ROMAN. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.